All right, so let's roll. All right, well, up first today, we have Peter and Anita. They wrote in and said, how far or low can Sweden go in accepting Muslim immigrants? I understand to a degree why the government can't get enough of them. Millions of people, highly dependent on government welfare, can probably keep the ruling left in power. But what is wrong with the Swedes? Why are they putting up with all that? The negative consequences are pretty obvious to see, even without having to use any statistics. Crime, rape, no-go zones, things a few decades ago nobody would believe are all going on in Sweden. And yet the Swedes keep waving these welcome refugees shopping bags and keep paying ridiculously high income tax so that Muhammad can be the most popular name in the country. Seemingly, the vast majority of Swedes are fine with that. Why? Is it some sort of historical guilt for not taking part in the world's wars? Is it that Swedes are afraid of conflict and would rather accept the situation than try and do something to change it or at least voice their concerns? That's from Peter and Anita. Hi, guys. How you doing? Hey, Stefan. Nice to chat with you. Yeah, thanks. For nice to us. chat with you. I wish the subject matter were happier, but this is um, important stuff to talk about. So I appreciate you guys calling in. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right. So uh, what's the view on the ground these days? Um, we get conflicting reports from outside of Sweden uh, because there does seem to be some pushback finally, finally beginning to occur. But uh, what are you guys experiencing there? Well, you know, what 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 we hear on, you know, news and TV and mainstream media is, as you know, pretty much a very kind of censored version of what is really going on. And, you know, my kind of question is, you know, because as I said in the question, to a certain degree, I kind of understand why, you know, the government would be all right having all these people in. It's just that the Swedes seems to be fine with it. And I'm not sure if they're just kind of pretending or maybe they're afraid Probably they're afraid that they'll be called like racist and xenophobes and stuff. But it's just, it's obvious that their country is changing rapidly. And, you know, they all seem fine with it. It's like, oh, it's a good thing even. <laughs> so. And what, but what is the, so the, the good thing aspect, and just for those, we just did an uh, interview with um, a Swedish uh, figure today, which we'll release probably next week. But uh, as she pointed out, in a country with less than 10 million people, there are now 1 million Muslims. Right. And that would be like over 30 million Muslims in America. Right. And that is a truly staggering number. And I was reading, I don't know if it was in Sweden or not, I was reading the other day that um, a Muslim family with nine kids was having trouble conceiving the 10th child. And they demanded that the government pay for in vitro fertilization. Astounding. Astounding. Right. Um, so, do you have, I mean, you're there. I certainly have my thoughts, but you guys are the ones actually there. So, what do you think is driving this belief system seems so utterly at odds with historical and fundamental reality? Well, I guess... The people in power, like the people who are taking decisions, are thinking maybe of, you know, they're basing the, that kind of policy on the um, idea that, you know, bringing in more people would eventually be a positive, net positive for the country. And they're probably looking at the states in the beginning of the 19th century and, you know, making the conclusion that, you know, all these people went to the states and look at what happened there. I mean everything turned so well. Yes, but they were almost all British and certainly European and certainly white. Yeah, and you actually made that point before on your show that it's one thing to have, you know, Germans and Nordic people coming in and in like half half a, a generation, you don't even can distinguish them from the, from the you know, the Americans, they're natives. But yeah, it's a very different thing when you, when you bring in people that, you know, basically have uh, not you know, low, low IQ, they don't, they're not able to do many things. And, you know, they're reliable, they rely on the government for everything. Yeah, no, no, no welfare state in the 19th century. Of either. course. And maybe that's why, uh, <laughs> that's why things actually turned out so well for the US. But that's the thing that, you know, it's, you know, you're very much aware of what's going on in the academia these days. It's like you run uh, some research until, you know, you get, uh, you know, massage the data the way you want until you get the results you want. So, you know, Muslims or 
Nordic people or Germans, it doesn't matter, you know, cultures are the same, you know, the result is always positive for the economy because we are bringing all these new people and they work and they produce things and stuff. So to a certain degree, well, they, they certainly do produce things, Yeah, uh, <laughs> things that often go boom, but they certainly do produce things. <laughs> yeah, they produce flesh. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm thinking that probably a big part of that, a big part of, you know, that idea to bring up, bring more people in is that kind of research. And, you know, I'm coming from a um, economic, de economic history department and studying there, I just so the way the the research is done so you know they they run these regressions and you know they massage the data and you know they they don't take into account the real world but just the numbers so it's you know we bring in bring in 1 million so that would yield the you know the following results so i guess maybe people in academia have um you know yeah contributed a lot to that madness in a way by kind of giving excuse or how to say it by giving sort of uh, scientific evidence, or which is not really scientific, but so their their argument is that um, it's going to be fantastic for the economy, and it's going to make up for the lower birth rate of the Swedes to have um, IQ seventy five Muslims come into the country uh, by the hundreds of thousands. It's basically exactly the same as if you had a whole bunch of Swedish children that grew up speaking Swedish in the culture with the history. Well, yeah, I mean, the problem is that when you look into the numbers, I mean, these are just numbers, I mean, but behind those numbers, there are actual people. So if you then, if you don't take into account that these numbers are actually people and people are different and things like that, I mean, you're not obviously coming up to the right conclusion and thing. I mean, I think everyone understands that if the population were 90% Muslim, it would be a Muslim country, right? Right. I mean, they wouldn't be sitting there saying, well, you know, there are still 10% native Swedes here, so we're going to not put in an Islamic country. We're not going to impose Sharia law out of respect for the 10% minority Swedes. I mean, that has never happened before in the history, that, to my knowledge, of, uh, uh, of Islamic conquest. So I think everybody understands that 90% is an Islamic country. I mean, and so 80% is an Islamic country, 70% Islamic country, 60%, 50 plus one, 50% plus one, you know, on your way to uh, an is Islamic country. So 10%, okay, but it's not hard to run the numbers and say, okay, given the Swedish birth rate and given the Islamic birth rate, how long until the until the Muslims are, ma are a majority, and it's not long, right? Well, but, you know, if you do that kind of research, you know, you would be a racist, and your research would not see the world. <laughs> oh, it would. It just wouldn't see it in academic of the, uh, academics and the mainstream media. But it certainly would see the world, because there's the internet, right? Yeah. Well, sure, but maybe, you know, wouldn't be considered serious enough to turn into policy or, you know, Maybe. But this is this is just numbers. I mean, numbers can't be racist, right? No, of course not. But it's <laughs> and and the fact that Islamic people want an Islamic country, that's not racist. I mean, they've done it to more than fifty countries already. Oh, tell me about it. I'm a Bulgarian. So I mean, it's it's not racist to say that Islamics prefer or Muslims in general prefer Sharia law to Western legal traditions. No, but I I personally think that one of the main issues is that. Swedes and maybe some Swedish politicians naively think that these huge waves of immigrants are going to assimilate. Uh, they always, even politicians, are always bringing up the mass immigration to happen in Sweden in the 90s coming from the Balkans and Yugoslavia because of the civil war. And in that huge group there was a, a, a larger, rather large group of Muslims there as well, although they were Europeans but they were Bosniaks. And they're often saying that, well, look how this group assimilated. And most Bosniaks in Sweden today, they're working. Their kids are speaking Swedish. They're, a lot of them are even married to Swedes. And I think they're using that as a, they're trying to extrapolate and say, well, that will happen probably again. And what was the, uh, I don't know much about that, of course, uh, if anything, but what was the, um, what was the number of uh, people who came in from Eastern Europe, Anita? I think that during 90, 
93, 92, 93, when the largest group came, it was around 80,000. Uh, because uh, I think last year they said in Sweden that uh, 2015 saw the highest peak in immigrants since 92. So 92 saw around 80, 90,000 people coming in. So, well, last year's immigration wave in Sweden already beat that. Uh, but Well, and I don't know if anybody knows, but I would imagine that the birth rate is a little bit lower from Bosnia, uh, from yes. Bosnian uh, people than it would be from uh, African uh, or North African people. Well, yeah, and I, I personally, you know, although I'm Croatian, I, I come from what is currently Bosnia, and my parents and I, we both have a lot of Bosniak friends, and, well, although they are Muslims, they're very secular Muslims, and they're extremely well, into, you know, integrated and assimilated in Sweden, and actually a lot of Bosniaks that we know, they're taking a lot of distance, and they're almost just as worried as we are about this mass immigration wave that's coming, because even they think that a lot of these that are coming to Sweden now are too radical, and that's coming from Muslims that already live in Sweden, and that says a lot. Right. I mean, certainly the Bosnians, are, are they white? Well, yeah. I mean, I think ethnically they're Slavs, so they're Europeans. It's just that they converted to Islam a couple of centuries ago. <laughs> I'm sure entirely voluntarily. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, you know, because it's it's so appealing. Who wouldn't <laughs> want to? You know, uh, hey, so this is a club I join. Great. If I try to leave, you'll track me down and kill me. I'm in. I mean, who can resist a, an offer, literally, that you can't refuse? So um, let's see. We got some numbers here. December 31st, 2009. 51,000 people born in Bosnia and Herzegovina living in Sweden. And, um, yeah, they came to Sweden during the Bosnian War in the 1990s. So 56,000 uh, versus close to a million and that's a you know well a, a tad five percent a tad more of a manageable number right plus as you say i mean um race is is the one topic that is very tough to talk about with regards to immigration um races don't tend to mix very well historically and it is true that if you get people with different belief systems but the same race it will tend to blend over time Assuming that IQs are similar, and I think similar IQs will blend more than just about anything else, but if, if races assimilated or if different, really different cultures assimilated, there'd be no such thing as Ashkenazi Jews. For 5,000 years, the Jews without a homeland wandering the world, and they did not assimilate. They did not integrate. This is what's so funny about Jews pushing multiculturalism, saying, don't worry, they'll assimilate. Not that it's only the Jews, but, you know, a lot of Jews are pushing it. And they say, oh, everyone's going to assimilate. It's like, did you? And the answer is, you did not. You maintained your own cultural, tribal, historical identity, even without a country, even with being kicked out of dozens of countries, even with persecution, even with, even with, even with. So Ashkenazi Jews of all people should know that integration, well, it ain't a walk in the park for a lot of cultures and groups. And the stronger the in-group identification, the more difficult it is to integrate. The welfare state, of course, creates a mode of economic non-participation in that you can survive without participating in the economy of a country that reduces the need to integrate. And language barriers, of course, significantly reduce the need to integrate. And um, if your kids look different, fundamentally, it's just tougher to, uh, to integrate. We're tribal species, and um, race differences are not insignificant, um, not just culturally, but in terms of biology. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, and I think that, as I said before, Sweden is, Swedes are a bit naively thinking that past successes in immigration is going to, you know, it's just history is going to repeat itself. And Sweden has a really successful history of immigration, everything from, you know, pure labor immigrants through the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then the immigrants during the 90s. And it's just a very, very sensitive topic in Sweden to talk about race. So no one really talks about these immigrants. Com compared to where, where it's a no problem topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they just, they just don't like when you refer to this as a different racial group. You just refer to them as refugees. And you just compare them to others who have successfully assimilated in Sweden, but you never, as media never would mention the fact that this is a person of a dif different ethnicity, of a different race. You just don't talk about things like that. 
Sure. And look, I understand that. I mean, if you take the premise that race is merely a social construct, if you take the premise that there are no fundamental differences between the races, then it would be irrelevant to talk about race. Like, again, if you accept the premise, then it follows that, right? I mean, if, if you'd say, well, we, we'd love to have some immigrants, we just don't want short people. That would be a little bit confusing unless your country is basketball villa or something like that, right? Because if you because height has no particular reference point as far as intelligence goes or anything or, or, or you know, integration thing goes. But so given that we understand that height is, oh, you know, bald versus her stoot or whatever it is, big boobs versus medium boobs versus small boobs. I'm just talking about men here because, you know, I'm getting older. I got to worry about these things. But if you were to look at inconsequential characteristics and say, well, we don't want short people in here, we don't want bald guys in here, and we don't want, you know, women with big boobs or whatever, right? So then what would happen is people would say, well, that's kind of an irrational prejudice because those things have fundamentally nothing to do with your capacity, whether you're going to succeed or fail in Sweden, right? That would be – so if, if, if you accept the premise, which has been pounded into everyone for decades – well, basically, since the communists came up with a strategy called let's cry racism all the time in the 1920s. Then if you believe that race is a social construct, that the the brain size differences between the races, that the, the amount of white matter in the brains of different races being different levels, if you believe that the IQ test that... Um, discriminates between the races or differentiates between the races, if you believe that has no effect, or all of this is just arbitrary, all of this is just made up, then of course it makes no sense to say, well, I have a problem with this particular, or I, th I think there's going to be a problem with this particular race. That's like saying, I just have a problem with short people. That's obviously a pretty irrational bigotry, unless you're a woman who likes to wear heels and wants to keep looking up a guy's nose all night. So if you, if you accept the premise that race is just a social construct, then all concerns about different races are racism. And that's the beauty of that. You know, if you embed that in people's thinking, then anybody who's got concerns about the races, well, they have to be racist. So, and, and the question is, can anyone chip away at that basic argument? Bill Nye just recently posted about this. A race is just a social construct. It's like, I don't know if he knows that the races have different numbers of vertebrae. They have different bone density. They have different amount of twinning. They have different gestational periods. Uh, the, the, the children of the babies and children of different races develop at different rates. Um, I, I, like, I, it, it's just become a kind of, I don't even want to call it a religion because that's an insult to religion. It's just become, I guess what the French would call an idée fixe, just something that people adhere to, not because... They believe it, not because it's been proven, but because they're called good if they adhere to it, and they call, they're called evil if they don't adhere to it. So it's because we have this totalitarianism of pseudoscience called radical racial egalitarianism, we have this totalitarianism where people's lives can be destroyed if they do so much as even question the perfect egalitarianism of the races in important cognitive matters. So we already have a kind of totalitarianism in place, and that's why it's impossible to fight a totalitarian ideology like Islam, because we already have a totalitarian ideology called political correctness. Yeah, you're entirely right. I, um, when you say, though, um, you know, when we talk about religion, I'm thinking maybe, you know, Swedes, modern day Swedes are kind of very far from religion and you talked about that at atheism on your show a lot uh and i think that also has something to do with uh with the way they're you know accepting all that all that is going on sweet ah yeah sorry sorry to interrupt and i i know i just gave a long speech but i'm sorry because this is such an important thing at least for me and hopefully it'll make sense to you i'll keep it brief atheists look it's fine that they gave up religion or it's fine that we gave up religion so i'm an atheist right it's fine to give up religion, but then you better bloody well embrace science. Right? Because if you're going to give up religion as that which 
confirms or, or affirms what you know to be true. If you're going to give up religion, then you better damn well get your way to science and stay there. But my problem is that the atheists have given up religion, but they have embraced the leftist doctrine, which is completely anti-scientific, of radical racial egalitarianism. Right. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's not a type of religion. If that's the religion. It is. The government. It is. And it, see, it, so re religion gave you something to defend, right? This is our faith, our history. Um, Odin is my lord and master, you know, as I sort of repeat every morning. But <laughs> so it, it, it's fine. So this is why Christianity survived against Islam for so long, right? Because you, you've got something to defend. Now, if you are going to give up on religion, fine. Then go to science, for God's sakes. And science very clearly says that the races are not equal, and it doesn't mean that one race is superior to the other. It just means that they've adapted to different environments, different circumstances. And atheists, the fact that they've given up religion, which was the defense against Islam in the past, and have not embraced the clear science of racial inequalities, means that they're in a no-man's land. They're in a null zone. They have nothing to defend. They can't found their concerns about racial integration on science, and they don't have a faith to defend. So what they've done is torn down the wall between the West and Islam, and they're not building a new wall called science. So the atheists are significantly responsible for the undoing of Europe as it stands, because, because they have exchanged the religion of Christ for the religion of political correctness. And they've got the same rewards and punishments. It's the same priesthood. It's the same bullshit. Except it's a bullshit that no one cares to defend Europe with. And that's the big danger. Yeah, yeah, it sounds about right. I mean, it, it's not, the problem is not that they really gave up on Christianity, but that they embraced something else that is causing the problem, which is you know, the belief that there's always going to be a government to take care of you and regardless of what's going on these people know what they're doing and you know they have our best interests in mind and i mean if 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 the races are so much the same and race is just a social construct people should really tell everyone's kidneys that because you try taking a kidney from a white person and putting it in a black person 20% of blacks are so genetically incompatible with whites, they reject all organs from all white donors. Their bodies will re reject it. Try being a doctor and pretending all the races are the same, you'll get sued for malpractice. Blacks have susceptibility to high blood pressure, uh, other stress-related ailments, heart disease and so on. Jews, uh, Tay-Sachs disease and other particular issues. Uh, white people have, uh, I don't know, terminal cuckishness and... Uh, um, some pathological altruism-itis or something like that. So, I don't know. This, um, so from, from the atheist standpoint, they um, have basically gone more anti-science than Christians. I mean, the Pope even accepts evolution. And so the atheists can claim that, oh, you know, those Christians are so anti-science. It's like, okay, which, which is more important? Whether God or the Big Bang or some giant cosmic font created the universe 14 billion years ago, or whether there are differences between races currently crashing in amongst each other. Which is more important in the world right now? The science that the Christians deny is completely inconsequential to current world problems. The science that the atheists deny. Well, atheists are like Jehovah's Witness parents who aren't letting their terminally ill child or their child ill with a terminal illness, not get any treatment. That, that's worth, and even that only kills one helpless child, let alone civilization as a whole. So atheists are um, radical, radical anti-science zealots and fundamentalists. And that is one of the foundational issues that is facing Western civilization is the degree to which atheists have betrayed science, undone religion, and opened up the West to this mess. Yeah, right. Well, I, I think in Sweden, why, why, what we have been talking about is, it's very easy to uh, say, welcome all refugees, and we should be politically correct about every single thing that's happening when it's happening somewhere else. 
uh, because then you don't see the actual consequences of what's happening. But in Sweden, so much has changed recently. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, and although I know the 90s were probably very different everywhere, but it's been a radical change in Sweden and also in Swedes, I would say, from yeah, just in 15 years. And the strange thing is that non-ethnical Swedes are seeing these changes and they're seeing these like un-Swedish things happening and they're not reacting. And we were thinking, is it maybe because they're scared of reacting or they're scared of speaking out? There seems to be some kind of not just political or media censorship, but there's a censorship even in, you know, amongst friends, amongst family members even. Like no one talks about things that are important. And if you touch upon a sensitive topic, people immediately say, oh, it will, I'm sure it will get better. You know, there's nothing we can do about it. And then they change the topic. So it's like people are scared even to discuss some things, which just makes, it really makes no sense. Well, it's magical thinking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, you know, I have a lump, but if I don't go to the doctor, I'll be fine. Lump keeps getting bigger. If I don't go to the doctor, it's just, it's just magical thinking. And unfortunately, nature is not kind to fantasy. Now, I can tell you most likely why the politicians are doing it. I, you know, as far as the Swedes go, I'll, we'll come back to that. But as far as the politicians go, I don't know. Hopefully you guys haven't. But have you ever known an addict? Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to face it. You're addicted to love. No, what? Um, okay, so what, what are, what's your, Peter, what's your, what's your addict story? Well, I've had friends that, you know, like drugs and stuff and, you know, had problems with it. But, you know, are you going to say that uh, it's, you know, the power and they're addicted to power and they would do anything, you know, even probably ruin themselves in order to get more power? You mean the politicians? Yeah, yeah, the politicians. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is something that's really important for people to understand. The political power is an addiction. It is, a, it is an addiction. And not just it's like an addiction. It is an addiction. As you rise up in the hierarchy, you get additional dopamine hits and you become addicted to it. It's like cocaine. And we all know that there are addicts who will sell their own mothers into slavery in order to get their next hit. And the people who are currently in power want to stay in power. Do they care about 10 years from now, 20 years from now? No. Any more than any addict cares about 5 or 10 years from now. They're just looking to keep the high of political power going for themselves for the next five minutes. And confronting the challenges that face Europe right now is very likely going to deprive them of their hit, of their drug of choice, political power. Or it has that risk. Well, sorry. And so they're, they're addicts and they don't, I mean, they don't care about the long term effect because addiction is basically screwing up your life for the sake of immediate pleasure and that's what politics has devolved into sorry peter you were going to say yeah yeah are you sure about that that you know they will end up you know ruining themselves in a way because you know if they manage to stay in power because of the you know immigrants or whatever you know they would still be living in their fancy stockholm neighborhoods where you cannot even see anyone that is not blonde so oh well yes but that's not going to last forever uh, but they'll they'll just escape. I mean, they'll just go somewhere else. I mean, they're rich, they're powerful, they they have political contacts. They'll just go emigrate somewhere. They'll just leave behind a smoking Sharia crater of former civilization. And they'll just jet off to someplace new. Right. And you know that's exactly what I don't understand because you know I can see why the politicians would be you know doing it, but Swedes, you know, it's such a proud nation. It's a nation with such history and so much. They, they've done so much inventions and, you know, during the Industrial Revolution and, you know, today we're even using things that wouldn't like have not been possible, may, uh, maybe Skype, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we wouldn't be talking if, if it was for the Swedes. And, you know, these people, you know, they're not like dumb people. I mean, they should be seeing these things. And I just, you know, my mind, you know, cannot kind of bear it. Well, why would they put up with all that in such a manner? And, you know, you ask them, you know, or journalists will ask them something about it. And they would just say, everything's fine. Everything's perfect. You know, see that, you know, says here, refugees welcome. You know, we're, I just don't get it. 
I'm going to read you just a sentence from a study. It says, um, protecting the welfare state that generations of Swedes have built does not seem to be a priority for the Swedish Social Democrats. Some have long claimed that the Social Democratic affinity for immigration has to do with the party's desire to fill the country with election cattle. And fuel has now been added to that fire. Muslims often seem to vote for the left, studies show. For example, 93% of French Muslims voted for Socialist President François Hollande, and almost 90% of American Muslims voted for President Obama. So why is President Obama allowing or encouraging or facilitating or funding the import of a quarter million Muslims? Because he, Muslims into America every year because he wants the voting base. And leftists are running out of good arguments, so now they just need to put their fingers on the scale to stay in power. You know, if, if Muslims are the drug dealers of your political crack, well, you'll just bring them in to stay in power. Right, but so they just want the they just the the the, the governments are all left in Europe. They're all radically left of center, and the Muslims will vote for them, which tells you a little bit about something about the compatibility of leftism, which is a totalitarian ideology, and Islam. And so they are importing these people to stay in power. And why do they need to import them now? Because the lie of the welfare state is reaching its end point. The lie of the welfare state. Now, the question is why? Why is this ideology of radical racial egalitarianism so common among the left? Well, for a variety of reasons, but not least of which is the basic fact that if, let's say, North African Muslims are not compatible with Swedish culture, and let's say that they said, okay, we're going to put a hold on this, we're going to pour, pour, whatever they would do, right? Well, then what? How on earth is the replacement rate in Europe of 1.3, 1.5, 1.6 children per couple, counting the immigrants? Let's just talk about the whites, which is far lower. How are all of these pensions and unfunded liabilities going to be paid for by a generation who demanded every benefit from the state but did not breed the taxpayers necessary to pay for those benefits? So the people in power, if they can't pretend that they're moving in people just like Swedes who are going to pay lots of taxes and fill up the coffers of the welfare state and the pension state and the free healthcare state, if they can't pretend that they're importing people just like Swedes, well, they'll have to admit that they can't pay their bills. They have to admit, sorry, can't pay you your pension. Can't do it. So what the drug dealers do when they run out of their drug? Well, they mix in other stuff to pretend they have more. You see? Put the baby powder, put the talc in the cocaine. And that's, I think, fundamentally what's going on. They can't admit to their population that it's been a big, giant Ponzi scheme that's sucking the lifeblood out of the younger generation. So they have to pretend, oh no, don't worry, we've got this magic fix. We're not running out of cocaine, we got baby powder. We're not running out of people, we'll just bring in North Africans. They're exactly the same, so we can keep this whole thing going. Well, I guess I guess you have a point here because, you know, Swedes generally believe in the welfare system. I mean, I don't, and I think it always 100% ends up badly. But Swedes have that, you know, the memories no, of the no, 50s. Oh, God, you don't know. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You don't know your own history, and I hate to be annoying and put it that way. How old is Sweden as a country? Ah, uh, well, quite old, I guess. 800 years or so? Yeah, something like that. Well, it's not thousands. All but... right. It's 800 on, between 800 and 900 years, right? It's a really, really old country, right? Of course, yeah. Okay. How, for what proportion of Swedish history was there a welfare state? Very tiny. It's like after the Second World War, I guess, but... Right. Actually, I think a little bit before if you count other aspects of it. Okay. So, for the vast majority, for like over 90% of Swedish history, 95% of Swedish history, no welfare state. Then you got a welfare state. Why? You're right about that. I'm not questioning it. I'm just saying. No, no, but why did you get a welfare state? Because if you don't know that, you won't know how to oppose it. 
Well, you got a welfare state after the Second World War, because you know. Not when. Why? <laughs> and it's the same answer across the entire world. For more power, I guess. No, politicians always wanted more power. Well, in sort of to create dependency in the population, so that you kind of keep them with. Yes, something. but that's that's the mechanics. But why then, right? Why just then? Why not? Like if it was just uh, 60, 70 years ago, why not 600 or 700 years ago? Why not 100 years ago? Why just then? And this was true throughout Europe. Why just then? Throughout Europe, throughout North America, in England, in South Africa, all around 1930 to 1940. And it goes back to 1936 in Sweden. Right? 80 years out of an eight or 900 year history. Why did it happen all in the 1930s and 1940s throughout the entire Western world? Does it have something to do with um, maybe the, you know, the rise of the left, like the communists and... The rise of the well, you know, totalitarian ideologies have been around forever and the left has always tried to get its power, but why in such a giant wave. I think it's great that you don't know this. I mean, I'm not trying to be annoying, but I think it's great that you don't know this. And we actually have a presentation partly to do with this. And I don't mind if I can just give you the answer if, if, you, if you want to keep uh, guessing. Of course, go answer. ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, the reason that the Western world has a welfare state is because women got the vote. All right. So it's like emotions and stuff and not that much science and logic. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's not just that. I mean, there, there's logic to what women did. It's not irrational, right? Women, in general, will always trade freedom for security. Because they have children, and they can't afford freedom. They need to feed their children. And so women always have this challenge, when, you know, back when European women had children, but women always have this challenge, which is they marry some guy and now they're dependent on that guy because before birth control and all that, which is when the welfare state stuff started to come in, they'd have three, four, five, six or more kids, which meant that they really can't work for most of the middle part of their life. And it wasn't like life expectancy was huge back then. So for the majority of their adult life, they're disabled right? They're pregnant, they're breastfeeding, they have small kill children around, and they weren't this huge amount of labor-saving devices. I could try to explain to my daughter the other day, hey, this is called washing a dish. Right? Hey, when I grew up, this is, we'd spend, seemed to have spent half my damn childhood with my hands in the suds, right? So women were pretty much disabled economically throughout almost all of human evolution, and certainly in the West up until the mid-20th century. And so what happens if a woman chooses the wrong guy. She chooses a guy who turns out to be a drunk, who turns out to sleep around, who turns out to not really make much money, to have a bad temper. Even if he doesn't hit her, her maybe he just gets fired a lot. But she's got children. What's she going to do if she can vote? Vote for someone who will support her instead of her husband. Right. Because having a husband is risky. Having a welfare state is not. Yo, in the long run, is, in the long term, it's uh, quite risky, man. <laughs> and this happened every sing within 10 to 20 years of women getting the vote. Every single Western country that I've looked at had a welfare state. It makes perfect sense. It started with retirement benefits. Well, women live longer than men, which means that women are left if their husband hasn't saved or they haven't been wise with their money or they just don't have money or whatever. Women want retirement benefits because they live longer than men. And then it was health care. Why? Because women consume more health care resources than men. Because they live longer, because they have kids, because there's weird echoey plumbing that makes tinny sounds when you listen to it up close with a stethoscope. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. But women want, and then oh, earlier that, of course, women wanted free schooling for their for their kids because that gives women stable jobs the kind of well, government will take over and they can't get fired and of course uh, if you've got a bunch of kids schooling can be not cheap 
So if you look at sort of the development of the welfare state, how was it that Europe was able to last for thousands and thousands of years without a welfare state and then boom, 10 to 20 years after women get the vote, oh look, welfare state. Right, women get the vote in Sweden in 1921. By 1936, you have a welfare state, 15 years. And that's about average for every single country that I've studied. Women get the vote and they want, they still want to marry the guy, but they want the state as their hot Latino lover with an infinite bankroll that they can run to should something untoward happen with the dude, right? Right, well, (laughs) what... (laughs) Okay, I'll ask you something on Danita's behalf. So should we forbid them to vote? <laughs> How long have you listened to this show? No, I'm kidding. Well, maybe... No, of course, nobody should have the vote. The, the problem <laughs> wasn't that women got the vote. The problem was that men had the vote. Yeah, yeah. Right? The, People nobody think should it. have the vote. We should not have a government. But that's not about to happen, right? Yeah, it's not about to happen. But it's, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. It's, uh, you know, people taking decisions on behalf of other people. I mean, that's the problem. It's not about women doing it or something. Well, no, it, it is about women. It is about women because this is a particular, we have, to man, we have to diagnose the problem in order to understand what's happening. And this is why women who are married vote for smaller government. And women who are single vote for bigger government. Why is that? Yeah, right. Makes sense. But Why? Well, they, you know, they want security, as you said. I mean, they, they vote for security and they want to make sure that there will be someone to take care of, you know, their bad decisions maybe and deal with the... Okay, cons- that's for the single women. They want a big government to take care of them. But why do married women vote for smaller government? Well, they already have the security from their husband in that case. Well, it's not just that. Why wouldn't they want additional security? never thought of it like that yeah me too i never really thought of it like that but well if a woman is married she's probably at some point either has kids or is thinking of having kids and if she votes for bigger government what happens to her husband's paycheck yeah you're right more taxes goes low more taxes so single women they want lots of taxes because women pay taxes at far lower rates than men like in England, women pay two, th- like pay one third the amount of taxes that men do, right? So if a woman is married and she's happily married in particular, okay, she's already got a stable husband who she's going to love and who's going to take care of her. And so if there are a bunch of predatory, vampiric single moms and women's floating around, they, the single moms are going to all vote for bigger government. That's going to come out of the paycheck of the man she's relying on. Yeah, well, and in Sweden especially, there's a lot of single moms or divorced moms. Uh, I think most of the friends I grew up with had uh, one mom and a dad and then a second dad and then a third dad. And like, I don't know if I have one friend who had married parents. They were all right. raised by single parents or divorcees or mothers dating other men. And it was actually very rare to meet someone who had married parents. Right, right. Because the state will walk in and provide. And this is another reason why there's feminism. Right? Because if the state is going to provide for you, you don't have to be that nice. You don't buy a hooker flowers. And you don't have to be nice to men if you can force men to provide for you through the power of the state. You don't have to be nice to them. You can, you can speak shit about them all you want. You can call them assholes, chauvinist pigs, uh, misogynist, racist, patriot. You can spit on them all you want. Because normally if you spit on someone who would voluntarily give you your money, they won't give you the money. So that's going to limit the amount of nastiness you can generate because you you got to survive. But if the government is going to force men to give you money, that's like the government forcing women to give men sex. What's going to happen to the flower business? Well, it's going to take a little bit of a dive. Well, and I think in Sweden especially, there's a, maybe because we have such a strong feminist movement here, although I do not agree that what we have here is a feminist movement, uh, men are viewed as very disposable here. Uh, well, and they are. They are. I they mean, totally are disposable because they, 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 they're, they're, they're cattle and they can just be forced to do whatever the women want because women outvote men. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, just like an, another case from my from my past is that we had a neighbor who was, he was Greek, but he had been living in Sweden for, you know, most of his life. And he was married to a Swedish woman who had a child from an earlier marriage. She got a child with him. 
And when that child was like three years old and they seemed to have a perfectly happy marriage. And then suddenly one day he said she just wanted to divorce because she wanted to live her life again. And, sure. she, and she just left him with, you know, she would sometimes come and visit the kids. And it just seems like she just dropped him and just moved on to the next guy. Yeah, because Western feminism and the state has turned marriage into a Soviet factory. You know, nobody cared to work that much in a Soviet factory because you get paid either way. And so in a marriage, the woman's going to get paid either way. She gets paid if she's there. She gets paid if she's not. She's going to get the money either way. So unless you totally love your job, you're just not going to show up. I mean, ask most people what happens when they win the lottery. They win the lottery. They say, take this job and shove it. <laughs> right? Because they don't, they don't want to go in and drive around the forklift truck or milk the Cambodian sex cow or whatever it is, right? <laughs> you guys know. Anyway, so, so if women don't have to show up to the job called wife, they get paid either way. Well, unless they totally, totally, totally love their husbands, which they can't do if they've always got one foot out of the door because the government's saying, shaking its purse over on the street corner saying, come here, big boy. I don't know. I just mixed up my genders, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Um, so... Women don't have to show up to marriage to get paid. And so it's just like a Soviet factory. You know, they they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work, except it, with the state, they really do. So now we have this radical matriarchal society because women outvote men. And women are the primary school teachers. I assume that's as common in Sweden as everywhere else, like 96% of the primary school teachers are women. So you have a radical matriarchy in the West, a radical, coercive, fascist-style matriarchy where the government pillages and destroys men for the sake of providing security to women. And what's happened is, in the Arab world, not particularly <laughs> matriarchal, I guess we could say, <laughs> the patriarchal Arab world has looked at Europe and said, ah, a matriarchy. Easy pickings, boys. Easy pickings. You know, th that's the that's the somewhat upsetting thing here in Sweden is that uh, I think 99% of all the women you could ask on the street, are you a feminist? They would say, yes, I'm a feminist. Of course, I'm a feminist. But uh, they concern themselves with what they think are feminist issues, but they do not want to look into what they should be looking into uh, the other week it was uh it was not even swedish media it was international media because they would not write about something like that in swedish media but that on a, a refugee center somewhere in sweden they had allowed a 14 year old child to be married to a 20 something year old man and this did not happen in secret like the swedish taxation service was there and registered them as a husband and wife looking for a permanent asylum in sweden and I'm just thinking like, okay, you have all these proclaimed feminists in Sweden who are, you know, proclaiming their independence and we're so strong women, but they do not look at what they, you know, they don't care about these issues that should also, you know, be included in the feminist issues. Yeah, I mean, they're not feminists. There are no feminists in the West as far as I would understand the term. Feminism is not geographical. Feminism is that which is supposed to promote the welfare of women. Now, women in the West are the most privileged women who have ever existed in the history of the universe. Ever, anywhere, anytime, any place, I don't care. Women in the West are the most privileged and almost pampered women who have existed anywhere in the universe. So feminism has clearly done its job. And in fact, you could argue it's done its job too well when we've got schools that are heavily gynocentric, that are drugging boys for misbehavior, which means they're, boys are just broken girls, let's drug them until they have tits. I mean, it's just crazy, right? When you've got a 60-40 ratio of women to men in higher education and feminists aren't saying, whoa, a little too far, let's back that up a little. No, if, if feminists really cared about women, they would be focusing all their attention on Africa and the Middle East because they would care about women. 
And so when you have in South Africa a third of men admitting to having raped a woman, and when we have no idea what the rape rates are in Saudi Arabia or other Middle Eastern countries, because under certain versions of Sharia law, it takes four male what relatives to, to confirm a rape. I mean, it's insane, right? So if, if feminists really cared about the safety and security of women around the world, then they would be focusing on where women are genuinely hard done by, which is to paint with a very broad brush with the exclusion of Israel, Africa, and the Middle East. That's what they would be focusing on, right? So why don't they? Why? Yeah, because they don't care about it, I mean. We, we were actually talking Well, no, that's, that's, that's tautology. Why don't you do something because you don't, like I say, say to my daughter, why, didn't, why did you do that? She said, because I wanted to. It's like, I know, that's why you, like, but why did you do it, right? Why don't they care? Because they, they say they care about women's issues and women's rights and so on. Why are they focusing on nagging men about spreading their legs a little bit in the subway? Man spreading, man splaining. Sometimes men over explain. <laughs> like, why aren't they focusing on the real rape culture that's occurring in South Africa, or why aren't they occurring? Why aren't they uh, dealing with issues that are going on for women in in Islamic countries? Because it doesn't benefit them. That's close to a tautology, but in what way does it not benefit them? Well. You know, these feminist issues like mansplaining and stuff, women in a way are, you know, kind of fighting for, you know, maybe having quotas in, you know, CEO positions and things like that. So maybe they're thinking that by being feminists and, you know, going after these issues would sort of result in some, you know, getting something, you know, again, getting something out of the government. Like we will have certain quotas, quotas for, you know, women bosses. So you get it. And, you know, maybe they see a path to getting some sort of reward by being feminist in a way. And again, right. So it's a shakedown. The reason that they don't complain to black men in South Africa or um, Muslim men in the Middle East is they can't bully those people. And also those people won't give them any money or opportunities, right? They just won't give them resources. Right. So uh, of course, right? I mean, they, they, it's got nothing to do with the equality of women. Because then they'd go and deal with those. Like it, it, it's all to do with who can I nag, who's got money, who will give it to me. That's all. I mean, it's nothing. It's just a shakedown. It's it's a it's a mafia move. It's got nothing to do with any ideology or anything like that. Because if if they were really concerned about a rape culture, they'd be concerned about Muslim immigration. But they're not. Well, that's the strange thing. Uh... It's not strange. The Muslims <laughs> won't like. I'd love some feminist to go nag. You know, go, 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 go into some, go into Molenbeek. You know, go, go into the Muslim ghetto. They never come. With a translator if you have to, and start nagging those Muslim men about how they treat women. What's going to happen? Some gender major studies, some women's studies <laughs> major goes in there. Well, if Trickly she, puff or whatever. <laughs> like, I mean, if she, I mean, she goes in and starts lecturing these Arabic men. Well, if she makes it out, I don't think, you know, either she won't get anything out of it or, you know, the academic world is going to say, well, that's a singular. It's an uh, outlier. <laughs> it's an outlier in the research. No, case. no, she's going to say that. No, the academic world will say, what did you do to provoke them? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Of course. Did you want it to be rape? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, the feminism, it's, um, it, it's like what some of the Black Lives Matter stuff can devolve into. Uh, it's just a shakedown, you know? Hey, do you feel, you feel like being called a racist on national television? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a shakedown. I mean, who can we nag who's going to give us money to, go, to make us go away for five minutes? But then maybe you could answer this, or you have maybe some better thoughts on this. But if these so self-proclaimed feminists are caring so much about the shakedown and what they can benefit from the government. How come it's not obvious to them that this mass wave of immigrants that very unlikely are going to start working if they start working within the next decade or two or three decades, that they will, the, these so-called feminists will suffer economically themselves. I mean, just, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, there were, it was the taxation declaration in Sweden and all the Swedes got back how much tax they would get returned. And I think the average compared to last year was 30 to 40% less. 
And I think that's just a nice way of increasing the tax because the government needs money, but without actually increasing the tax because they need money for someone who's now in Sweden. And it's just so strange for me how they're not reacting to these things because these things are affecting them directly. So the question is, why would the feminists not oppose the immigration of a pretty brutal patriarchal culture? Or why would they not oppose it out of a purely economical reason? Well, I'm sorry, just, do, you mean, do you mean because they won't get plum academic positions in a Sharia law dominated country, there won't be a lot of <laughs> women's studies. <laughs> <laughs> women's stoning has now replaced women's studies, right? Is that what you mean? Oh, I, I wouldn't want to go that far. I, I try to not be that cynical <laughs> here. <laughs> we have to live here. But it's just that it's you, you can see economical consequences in Sweden of what is going on. And it's it's astounding how no one is reacting to it. It's international media are writing more about it than Swedish media are writing about it. So it's like, no, everyone is just like putting on blindfolds for what's going on in the economy in Sweden. But look, look, a lot of radical feminists really hate men, really hate men, right? I mean, that's if you if you don't know that you're just not a guy. Well, but they should love money more, right? No, no, no. Hate. Look, I mean, hatred is is not economical fundamentally, right? I mean, to take an even more extreme example, you know, Hitler hated the Jews to the point where, you know, it helped him lose the war. I mean, you know, these irrational hatreds, uh, the, the communists hated the middle class kulaks so much that they murdered them by the millions and then provoked mass starvation in their own country. Hatred is not something that is balanced by economic considerations, right? Right. So you mean, so, so what you mean is that they hate men so much that they would even consider, you know, turning a blind eye to what's going on. No, it's worse than that. <laughs> You're such a nice young lady. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> For now, <laughs> right? But, but no, I mean, no, it's worse than that because um, anybody with half the brain of a goose can see where, if unchecked, where this is probably going to end up going, which is some sort of civil war, right? Now, are the feminists going to be strapping up and marching down Main Street? <laughs> no. No. It is fundamental, and I've talked about this in the Gene Wars presentation, but it's fundamental to our selected species that they enjoy creating conditions which destroy K-selected men. Feminism is pure our selection, which is why it's so hostile to men, and in particular to fathers, and to K-selected men, right, to, to Western white men usually. Because if, if you can destroy K-selected men, you create the environments which cause the our selected gene set to flourish, right? So if the feminists really hate men, and not all, but you know, the, the feminists that do hate men, well, this is going to probably get a lot of men destroyed, right? Well, I always said personally that I think Swedish men are really, really nice. And I always got much better along with them than Swedish women. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> well, I'm not talking about Swedish women as a whole. Like, I'm talking about the more radical uh, feminists. But there is an age-old, and, you know, you, you, you can see this all over the animal kingdom. There's an age-old reproductive strategy that females of a species pursue, which is to provoke a, a fight against, is to provoke a fight between men and sleep with the winner. And I'll tell you this, do you, you want to hear something even darker? <laughs> Go on. Oh, yes. We've not hit the bottom yet. <laughs> Going down, Mr. Tyler. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's, there's one level. I, I put this forward as a, a very, very tentative thesis. And I'm you know, perfectly happy to be shouted down with cries of perhaps legitimate outrage. So, but I'll, I'll put it out there. Are you ready? Yes. For a Western man, would you rather live as a patriarch in a Muslim country or under a gynocentric, radical feminist, state-driven matriarchy as it stands? Is that really a question? First one, of course. <laughs> 
Okay, good. I'm glad you took that one up, Peter. Please, would you like to expand upon this so I don't have to? <laughs> well, you know, I'm kind of living in Sweden and I, you know, see see the men here. I mean, the men, in a way, are often more feminine than women, you know. They're broken, right? They're broken. really broken. You know, I, I can I can share some experiences. You know, before I met Anita, before we started dating, you know, I was, you know, interested in other girls as well. And I had some very weird experiences by trying when trying to, you know, you know, hit on a girl. Yeah, it's like I'm going to go there with, you know, all my brilliance. <laughs> and I'll just say something that would be a compliment that, you know, you know, you're sexy or something like that. I mean, I wouldn't say it in a rude way or anything. And the answer would be something like, oh, my God, I know that I am. Who are you to tell me that? <laughs> Which is just like, all right, okay. <laughs> I'm I'm the gender that that you're sexy for. I mean, <laughs> it's like it's like like you put a beautiful picture up and you say to the guy who says nice picture, "Who are you to tell me that?" Yeah, exactly. Well, why did you anyway? Okay, anything else? Oh no, but th that's what I mean. That it's just the the roles are kind of turning here, and the men are the se the complete opposite. Then the unfortunately Swedish men, which can be really nice, they rarely dare to approach you when you're outside whether it's a bar or a cafe unless they've had something to drink i mean of course the it's this is a very crude generalization but my experience is that uh, swedish men are very hesitant and maybe it's because they have bad experiences of you know women around them have being told that you shouldn't do this you should let the women speak you should let the woman walk before you etc etc but they just seem so careful and afraid that they're going to offend someone by saying something. No, no, no. It's not afraid of offending. I mean, and sorry, I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but um, it's not like, uh, Anita, it's not that they're just afraid of offending. No, they're afraid uh, of rejection. <laughs> no, they're not afraid of rejection. Men men have been dealing with, with offending people and being rejected for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, no, and I again, I'm no expert on the laws in Sweden, but just from what I've seen, in other Western countries and some of the stuff that I've studied, um, you know, to do with, uh, you know, the John Gameshi trial and, and, uh, the, the mattress girl and Lena Dunham and, and this one that went on with UVA, uh, uh, university of Virginia, where there was this claim of serial brutal rape with broken glass and all turns out to be mostly nonsense. Apparently, <clears throat> if you look at this as a whole, a woman can wake up one morning and decide to destroy you. And she has a damn good chance of doing so. Right? She can just go to the police. She can go to the campus. She can go and complain. She can just, she can just wake up one morning and decide to destroy you. And if it's more than one woman and they're colluding, they can do that. And even if you somehow survive the onslaught, your life is destroyed. No, that's happening. I, I know it is happening. That, that's happening all the time. I, in middle school, there were two girls who were having an, an argument. Uh, a male teacher went in between, and I just think he just like gently pushed them aside. I actually saw it. There was no inappropriate touching or anything going on. And then next day, I think he was suspended because they had reported him to to the police for sexual assault. Right. And, and, and now his life for the next five or 10 years is a complete nightmare. And even if he's eventually vindicated, yeah. his life is destroyed. It's like, it, it seems like they're almost, it's, it's become almost possible to use that as a threat. If you don't do what well, I almost think. possible. No, it, it is. is possible. It is definitely, yeah. definitely possible. But you know, uh, the ending of our question in the beginning of the show was more, you know. Wait, so sorry. I just, if you don't mind me uh, um, mentioning. Yes. Uh, and, and this is something that women are generally not, it's not visible to a lot of women, but men know this stuff, right? So this is a, a young a boy, a boy in, in high school. His name is Tyler Cost, K O S T. He's been in the Pinnell County Jail for over 550 days on what looks more and more like an anti-male hate crime. So a group of high school girls, 
all accused him of uh, being a serial rapist. And uh, so he was arrested and uh, he was not allowed out, of course. And what happens? What has happened? Well, apparently they watched some movie where girls conspire to destroy the life of a guy. And this guy was kind of a player and he's a good looking kid. And a lot of these uh, girls were saying, oh, I really wish you were my boyfriend and so on. And recently, the, um, the uh, attorneys uh, for, who were trying to defend him, they filed for a motion to try and get access to the female's Facebook messages and other teens and so on. According to court documents, the attorneys believe the messages show a plot to get revenge on this guy for being a player and claim the victims hung out with him in order to carry out the plan. The defense's motion to compel evidence one victim sends a message in the defense motion. One victim sends a message to the others. The coast needs to be, quote, taught a lesson. Another victim posted, let's fuck with his mind and his car. The same victim also posted that he had never touched her, even though she later accused him of whatever, right? And it is a... Um, now, I don't know, obviously, what the answer is going to be to this. Maybe he was this... Maybe not. But I do know this, that the women can virtually certainly do this and get away with it if it turns out that they lied. I mean, we just have to look at what happened to the accusers of John Gameshi to see that. And this is the incredibly dangerous fire that women and feminists as a whole are playing with. That when a generation of men grow up and see their fathers destroyed, in the divorce process, destroyed, taken apart, bankrupted, living in their car, refused access to their children. People are always talking about deadbeat dads. A lot of those dads are deadbeat because they're not allowed to see their kids by the women and by the courts. When they read about Paul McCartney's ex-wife getting God knows how many tens of millions of pounds of his fortune, when they read about the chameleon, sorry, comedian and great, funny actor, Dave Foley, being torn apart in the court system. When men see all of this, when they see men being taken down like ducks in a shoot, bang, 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 when they've lived it, when they've grown up with a man-sized hole where their father's heart should be. When they read about male suicides, which are very high, particularly as a result of divorce. When they see a system where men are broken up and sold for parts to feed women's vanity and greed. Hell, just walk through a mall. It's all for women. And of course, governments have a huge incentive to try and get as much money into the hands of women as possible because they'll spend it. It's good for the economy, creates jobs, none of that pesky spending which creates capital improvements for the next generation. No, no, get it into the hands of women, they'll spend it like drunken sailors. So when men see all of this in the West and they see a system where they are the hunted, it is open season on men in the West. Get married, significant chance the woman will just divorce you. You know, among upper class women, 80 to 85% of the divorces are initiated by the women. No fault divorce, where the woman has the environment where she can falsely accuse you of something and face virtually no negative consequences. I think in England recently it took the third false rape charge for a woman to finally get some sanctions from the court system. When the woman can lie to you and say the child is yours when it's not and you're still forced to pay child support, where the woman can divorce you for no reason and you then have to pay her alimony for the rest of her life in some places. After 10 years, I think in California, it's the rest of your life. Even if you were a perfect husband, even if you never cheated, even if you gave her foot rubs every night, she can just wake up and say, no, it's done. Now pay up. And if you don't pay up, if you lose your job, you can't declare bankruptcy and your income doesn't matter. If you lose your job, you still have to pay. 
And if you can't pay, and they'll drag your ass off to jail. There's no debtor's prison anywhere in the civilized West except for alimony and child support. You don't pay that, your ass is in jail. And good luck trying to make money to pay your child support if you're in jail. And good luck trying to get a job after you've been in jail. And God knows what has happened to you and you're traumatized. So men see all of that, this giant grinding gears of brutal spiky vaginas chewing up men, spitting them out for the shallow savage satisfaction of truly insane women and an insane system. And men are really bad at having in-group preferences because we're designed to fight each other to get the girl. Men are designed to backstrap, betray, outcompete, outearn, outbuy, outflash, outgimmick, outmuscle, outab, all the other guys. We compete for women. So men suck at having in-group preferences. But we better damn well learn. And I'm telling you, I am so close. I'm trying to resist this. I am so close to just disbelieving accusations against men the moment I hear them. I'm trying. By God, I'm trying because I'm... Working hard to stay objective, but I tell you, after false allegation, after false allegation, after a woman destroying a marriage for no reason, after a woman keeping a husband away from her children, a husband away from her children, why? Because she gets more child support that way. When I see women saying, oh, I'm in the army, I want to be in the army, because I'm a tough Xena warrior, Lara Croft style shooting soldier gal. Oh, wait, am I going to get deployed? Oh, look, I just got pregnant. Oh, well, I guess I can't get deployed now. When I see women, as I talked about in a show recently, openly discussing with each other, I overheard this conversation, openly discussing with each other exactly what timing they need to do to have their children make sure that their government payments go up in the right way. And I'm like, you unbelievable hags. That's my money you're talking about. That is my money you are taking, and a future generation who's grown up without a father, because working is is tricky. Working is a challenge. And you don't want to find a good guy, because then that means you'll have to be a good woman. And virtue is even tougher than working. And so with all of this, a giant egg rolling down a ramp, with fire and spikes and Vesuvius eruptions, a giant estrogen egg bomb rolling down, men tied to the train tracks, they can't even run away like Indiana Jones, big giant boulder, a vengeful Valkyrie state-wedded, cold-hearted femininity coming to crush men on the tracks. And you know what the Muslims are saying? Oh, we got it, bro. We can save you from that. And then the women turn to the men and say, well, you got to fight the Muslims to save us. I don't know. I don't know. I can certainly see the case where it's like, no, 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 no. In fact, I may even switch sides. If I may say, Stefan, I don't think at least women in Sweden are asking the Swedish men to fight for them, to fight for them against the Muslims. They, it, it's especially the women in Sweden who are holding up the huge signs of welcome and collecting money and, you know, being, you know, even accepting, uh, let's say, underage minors who are coming, who are all 15 to 17, according to them, accepting them into their private homes to take care of them, having a very motherly affectionate relationship with them uh so they actually seem to be very accepting of these young muslim men and it's mostly muslim men uh, and w- you know it's it's strange then that they seem to have this they enjoy living in a matriarchal society but then on the other hand they seem to be so positive to men coming from a a very patriarchal society well yeah but the fighting hasn't started yet right <laughs> I hope it never will. I I hope it never will either. But, you know, without significant moral intervention uh, and significantly volatile conversations, um, it's a a virtual certainty. Unless unless Europe just folds. If it just folds, then there won't be any fighting. 
there has been uh, an increase in, let's say, dissatisfaction among Swedes, but it's not open. Uh, you can yeah. see in the latest polls and whenever there's an anonymous voting, the right wing parties and the ones who are a, a bit immigration, opposing to immigration and opposing to these mass exceptions, they're having an, a real boom in supporters. I think in the latest poll, this the Swedish Democrat Party was the third largest party in Sweden. Sometimes it's even the second largest party, depending on when you measure. Uh, so it seems that, you know, a lot of Swedes are coming around, but they're not voicing it openly. Okay, so let's say that Sweden is somehow able to stop immigration tomorrow. Does that solve the problem? It, it would solve the problem if they successfully succeeded in integrating all those who have come so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yes. A magic wand can solve yeah. any problem, but we don't have one. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, since this immigration wave started, there has not even been that much success in integrating those who have arrived so far. They don't want to integrate. They don't want to integrate. Why would they? Statistically and dem demographically, they're going to win. Why, why would they want to integrate? when they can take over. Yeah, that's true. They don't want to and they don't integrate. Nothing. And it's, it's, not, it's not hard to figure out for people as a whole. I mean, just imagine, guys. Imagine if you, you two, right? If Peter and Anita go to Saudi Arabia, how long would it take for you to fully integrate into Saudi Arabian life and be at one with the natives and absorb and embody all of the Saudi Arabian values and speak Arabic perfectly and feel perfectly comfortable among everyone in Saudi Arabia who'd been there for thousands of years. How long would that take? Forever. <laughs> what about your kids? How long would it take for them? Well, if we raise them, I guess forever. Especially if you didn't want to integrate. Yeah. If you viewed it as a bad thing to integrate. Let's say you have two daughters. In Saudi Arabia, are you going to teach them that women should be subservient to men? That women shouldn't have political or driving rights? Are you going to tell them that the penalty for adultery should be stoning? Are you going to tell them that unbelievers should be stoned to death? Are you going to say that public beheadings are perfectly sensible penal policies? No. No, no but you would find it reprehensible to teach your children those things. Well, that's a lot of the immigrants. They consider it reprehensible to teach their children Swedish values. There is a difference, though, I think. I think if we would end up in Saudi Arabia, there is actually laws that would at least force us to say, at least superficially integrate. Like, I would probably have to start dressing very differently. Uh, but there are no laws in Sweden at all that even forces the mildest of integration. I mean, there, even when I was going to school, the uh, people who were Muslims got separate food in the schools. They didn't have to eat sure. with us. They, you know, sure. even now they're opening actually prayer rooms in most of the schools that when there's Ramadan, all the Muslims have days off, but none, no one else has days off. So it's more like laws are being made to accommodate for them and not as much as encourage them to integrate. Not at all. Well, Europe is, uh, Europe is paying them to not integrate. That's the welfare state. That's the benefits that they get for being migrants and refugees and asylum seekers and so on. If they fully integrate, they lose a lot of welfare benefits and have to work like everyone else. Why would they want that? Well, Stefan, that leads me to ask you something, uh, something else. Because you probably agree that you know the the welfare state ends. I mean, as the, you know, some smart people said before, you eventually run out of other people's money. So I'm thinking, when these people don't get what they're used to get, what happens? You mean the immigrants? Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll riot, of course. They'll riot, they'll attack, they'll, they'll try to create as much noise uh, and, and discomfort and, and violence and aggression as possible until they get their way. They'll have a very kerosene-soaked tantrum. I mean, this is not hard to figure out. It's happened before, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, in, in France, it happens regularly in American cities when certain minorities don't get what they want. Oh, just riot. Right, but I mean... And then your crack and all-powerful Swedish military will ride in with his yeah. pea shooter on his bicycle and try to restore order. <laughs> That's true. 
extremely powerful. They'll, they'll drop, you know what? They'll just send in feminist cluster nag bombs. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we're done. No, they'll, they'll riot, of course, right? And, and then they will um, escalate until they get what they want, until there's an armed confrontation. But how would they get what they want? I mean, well, what do they want? They don't want welfare. They want to use welfare to destroy the Western governments. This is not my this is not my imagination. This is economic warfare. They go into the Western government and they drain it of resources until it destabilizes, and then they do their thing. Yes, but afterwards they cannot get any more what they want. You know, I'm I'm, I'm speaking of you know a scenario. You know, I'm sorry, you, you didn't hear what I said. All right, sorry to interrupt. All right. They don't want welfare. They're using welfare to destabilize Western governments. All right. Okay. So what happens when the Western governments can't pay their bills? All right. They, and they can't take maintain over. order and have no military. And the police are overwhelmed. Well, you'd be surprised how quickly things can change. Just ask the Romanovs. Right. Well, but, you know, it looks like that may, might be just around the corner. I mean, it's not like the, you know, financial system is booming and everything is all right. I mean, these things are, you know, even for the regular Joe kind of sees it and feels it. Well, and that this is, you know, hopefully the lessons will be learned, which is there's a basic fact going on in the world and, and, the lessons for me are the same as they were when I first started doing the shows, which is to have a stateless society. But the basic reality is that the cultures and societies which are treating their women the best are dying off. And the cultures and societies which treat their women the worst are flourishing and aggressively expanding. And until people can wrap their heads around that enigma, this process will continue. Do you think that's possible in any foreseeable future? Well, if I didn't, I'd be playing hopscotch right now. Yeah. <laughs> right? No, listen, you guys are, uh, I mean, Anita, <laughs> Yes. How, how are you doing? I mean, this is a conversation that's hard for some women to hear, and it's certainly hard for, you know, I can already hear the thundering of the white knights riding up on their Xbox steeds, you know. Oh, are you saying that women ought to be enslaved while I throw my lance and myself in front of your spear-like horrible words that are wounding the tender hearts of the ladies? And it's like, no, of course women shouldn't be enslaved. Nobody should be enslaved. This is, co power corrupts everyone. Power corrupts everyone. Women have the most power these days, so they're the most corrupt. Nothing wrong with women. It's power. It's power. Power corrupts. So the fact that you're able to have this kind of conversation with me, and I'm not saying this is all proven. These are all just thoughts for which there is some evidence, but it's not ABC proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. But what's it like for you when I start talking about this stuff? Well, I agree with most of those things. And I mean, I've well, to be actually honest, I started listening to your show not too long ago. And, um, you know, now looking back on what I learned in primary school and high school here and what I've learned in the last few years, I think I've been very blind to so, so many things. Uh, well, blinded, not blind. Okay, blinded. So maybe that, you know, scenario where you say like all the radical feminists are going to storm up against this podcast because we said something negative against females maybe i would have been like that a few years ago because that was the kind of circles i was uh hanging out with though i would say that since i had a very good upbringing and i have close relationships with both my mother and father i never could get into this hate men uh let's say thinking that many of my friends did who you know thought that men were the worst possible things and you know you cannot trust them for anything but, you know, I, I have different experiences, personal experiences from that. So, yeah. Right. I mean, there's a very matriarchal society in um, Canada um, and in America, which is the Native Indians. Uh, women run the households almost exclusively in the Native American households. And uh, is, um, this is what... Um, 
one uh, fellow wrote to me who is a native. He said, it's why the reservation is a shithole populated with suicidal, drunken, drug-addled, ambitionless men. Because women run these households with an iron fist, you'd drink all the hairspray in the house too. Here's another matriarchal society, the American blacks. 73% of the kids born to out of wedlock homes. You know, you always hear these, these kids, right? Raised by the grandmother. The kids who are involved in crime or shot and resisting arrest or something. Raised by the grandma, no dad around. Stepdad, number four, he says whatever, right? He was a good boy. He did nothing. And so we just have to look at the matriarchal societies and the matriarchal societies. Uh, the West is now a matriarchal society and has been since the post-war period when a lot of the caves were wiped out. And um, matriarchal societies are not good at guarding themselves. Of course not, right? Women aren't. They didn't evolve to be roam around the perimeter or protect the robots. They're nurturers. And of course, because a lot of women don't have children in Europe, they view the migrants like children. They're sentimental. And of course, because they don't have their own kid children, they don't have that much to protect. It's like, can, can, we, can we just buy you some cats? Would that be okay? That is the sad, true reality in Sweden. I mean, how many, um, how many of you guys' friends have kids? Um, my Swedish friends? <laughs> None. Zero. Uh, zero. And actually, uh, all of them have dogs. <laughs> okay. First of all, the alt-right is coming over with turkey basters. But anyway, um, yeah, that's tragic. So, you know, w w why fight? And it's, it's going to be relatively comfortable for their lifespan compared to, right, fighting. You've got to have something to defend. What do they have to defend? Atheism. <laughs> well, no, they mysticism. Just, no, they just, they just care about themselves. They don't even have really strong family values so that they would say, okay, I don't have a child, but I'll fight for my parents or I'll fight for my siblings. Uh, it's a very very individualistic and to some aspect, maybe even selfish society in that, you know, the moment someone turns 16 or 18, they move away from home and they see their family on maybe Christmas and that's it. And why, why do you think the uh, young people don't want to spend time with their families? I don't think most of them have very good, very present parents. I mean, there, there was a recent study, I don't know how, you know, scientific it was saying that Swedish children are amongst the happiest in the world because their parents are so independent and because their parents offer them independence so early on which I think is just the opposite I don't think a child who's six years old should be giving you know ten dollars a week and say this is for your spending and nothing more right 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 well, you know, something is definitely rotten in the state of Denmark and Sweden and Germany and all these kinds of things. And um, I really appreciate you guys having this conversation. I mean, it is massively helpful. This is going to go out to maybe a million or more people. And if you can speak people's secret thoughts, it gives their secrecy great power. And with great power it can become revealed to others. If we think we're alone in our darkest thoughts, we experience shame. When we recognize that we are not alone in our darkest thoughts, we gain solidarity, a tribe of facts, of reason, of evidence. We are not alone. You are not alone. You guys are not alone. I'm not alone in these concerns. And there is a part of me, of course, that listens to myself and says, you crazy hyperbolic nutbag, it's going to be fine. I understand that. And boy, it'd be great if, it, if I could believe it in any, but I have to keep going back to the reason and the evidence and the facts. And it has been left so long, right? Sweden decided in 1975 with no public consultation to become a multicultural nation in the same way that America decided, the Democrats in 1965, with no public consultation and with specific lies told to the public about the effects of these policies, changed the Immigration Act to 
cut off immigration from Europe and open it up to the third world, decided to become a multicultural nation. Multiculturalism is fine as long as everyone in the multicultural society values multiculturalism. But if they don't, multiculturalism will lose. And I just did a podcast today. I won't do it justice here, but the difference between shame cultures and guilt cultures, Sweden is a guilt culture. In other words, the values are internalized and you feel bad if you don't, but it doesn't need any external enforcement. Don't have to have guys going around with sticks to hit you if you do something wrong. It's an internalized guilt-based culture. Other cultures are shame-based cultures where they use verbal attacks, in particular humiliation and verbal abuse, to enforce social rules. Shame-based cultures can never coexist for long with guilt-based cultures. Because when a guilt-based culture allows a shame-based culture to come into it, the shame-based culture pours their verbal abuse on the guilt-based culture, and the guilt-based case can't, can't fight back because the guilt-based culture can't make the shame-based culture feel guilt. But the shame-based culture can make the guilt-based culture feel a lot more guilt. And so they'll pay and appease because it's sort of like being in a boxing match. And one of you is just fighting regular, but the other one has a secret hidden switch in the boxing glove where if they push it, it sends 400 volts directly to the testicles of your opponent. Can't win. It's not a fair fight. And right now, guilt-based cultures kind of metastasized with feminism and gynocentric welfare-based statism. And uh, man, guilt-based cultures cannot stand in the face of the endless verbal abuse poured upon them by shame-based cultures. And uh, I think that's another thing that's happening in Europe right now. Listen, the guys got to move on to the next call. Thank you so much. Will you keep us posted on sure. how you are and what you're doing? Yes. Thank Thanks for Is it a useful call for you guys? Yes, very. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much. And um, I look forward to the comments. <laughs> Take care, guys. Take care, Steph.